This is the 2020 Ashton Family Reunion. There are other family names among us, and we are proud of all of them. Our connection to each other is through Tom and Norma Ashton, the parents of Tommy, Tim, and David. Everyone here is a descendant of these three brothers or the spouse of one of these descendants. It seems fitting at this reunion to tell as much of the story of Tom and Norma as we know. Since Tom and Norma have been promoted to glory, we will not spare the rough parts. We will tell as much as we know. This story begins with the birth of Tom. In Murray County, Tennessee, on November 28, 1915, Thomas Jefferson Ashton was born to Thomas Edmund Ashton and his wife, the former Daisy Lucy Cheek. Thomas was their firstborn. Daisy told us that Thomas, the father, known as Eddie, was very strict with his son Thomas. Henceforth, Thomas, the son, will be called Tom. Eddie would spank Tom when, instead of sleeping, Tom cried at night. Eddie was a school teacher and a forward thinker. He bought a Model T Ford somewhere around 1915. This was reportedly the first motor car in Murray County, Tennessee. He learned to drive it, but Daisy was afraid of it. Eddie tried to teach Daisy to drive. In the first lesson, Daisy ran into a tree and would never get behind the wheel again. Daisy lived to be 100 years old and she never learned to drive. In the fall of 1917, when Tom was almost two years old, Eddie developed appendicitis. Daisy told us that Eddie was driven to Vanderbilt Hospital in Nashville for treatment. They must have used the Model T, but it's not known who drove him. According to Daisy's story, the Vanderbilt doctor told them that Eddie was too late for an early operation and too early for a late operation, so there was nothing to be done at that time. Instead of waiting until the, quote, late operation, unquote, could be performed, Eddie was driven home. A short time later, on October 14, 1917, Eddie died from peritonitis caused by a ruptured appendix. Daisy was pregnant when Eddie died. She gave birth to Eddie's daughter, Doris, in December of 1917. Daisy Ashton had been in love with a man named Paul Dean before she married Eddie. Her parents, William and Penina Cheek, found Paul Dean unacceptable. They told Daisy that if she married this Dean fellow, the back of their hand was to her. So Daisy broke off her involvement with Dean and took up with Eddie. After Eddie died, Paul Dean was still around and Daisy restarted her relationship with him. This time her parents dropped their objections. Daisy and Paul were married. Paul was an alcoholic and undependable. Daisy and Paul lived in the Ashton family home, Eddie's home. Both of Eddie's parents had died, and his only living sibling, Lillian, was married and had her own home. Paul had no other place, but even so, he would disappear for several days and then reappear. Daisy and Paul had four children, making a total of six children, but Paul contributed very little to support his family. Daisy ran a small store to help finance the growing family. Paul was hard on his stepson, Tom. He brewed his own beer, and Tom told his sons that his stepfather forced him to drink this home brew. Paul once took Tom to a bar. Tom came home using lots of foul language. Daisy literally washed Tom's mouth out with lye soap and told him to never say those words again. For the rest of his life, Tom had exceptionally clean speech. The behavior of Paul Dean was too much for Tom to bear, so he left home 
and moved in with his grandparents, the Cheeks. Another advantage to staying with his grandparents was that they lived a lot closer to Columbia High School. Tom stayed with the Cheeks until he graduated. He rode a horse named Dan to school. The picture you see here is Tom holding Tommy on Dan's back. This horse lived to be over 30 years old. By the time Tom left home, the Ashton Dean family had seven members. Daisy, Tom, Doris, Bill, Ann, Norman, and Wayland. This picture was taken after Paul Dean had passed away in September 1936. Tom wanted to go to college. The family does not have many details, but they do know that he attended Bowling Green College of Commerce in Bowling Green, Kentucky sometime before World War II. Everything changed on December 7, 1941, with the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Tom said that he had seen newsreels of the soldiers in foxholes. He never liked farming, or the outdoors, or cold weather. He had heard that in the Navy there would be a dry bed to sleep on every night, and the food was good. So, following December 7, Tom went to the U.S. Navy recruiting office in Nashville. While he was standing in line, one of the Navy recruiters asked, is there anyone in this line who can type? It was a cold day and Tom's fingers were stiff, but he raised his hand and told the man that he could type. So the recruiter gave him a quick test. Tom said that he didn't think he did very well, but the recruiter told him he had a job at the recruiting station if he wanted it. Tom was sworn into the Navy on the spot and he started the job. He worked at the Nashville Navy recruiting office for about a year. During this time, he played some golf, but he never went through Navy basic training, which is one reason he never learned to swim. After that first year, most of the recruiting was completed, so Tom received orders to ship out on a destroyer. The first ship he was on was probably the USS Golf, a destroyer of the Clemson class launched in 1920. These destroyers were affectionately called tin cans. One of the Golf's missions was to conduct anti-submarine operations in the mid-Atlantic. The Goff received a Presidential Unit Citation from President Franklin D. Roosevelt for outstanding performance. The family has a copy of the citation with the accompanying service ribbon. Tom traveled in the North and South Atlantic and visited Africa and Iceland, among other places. On the ship, Tom was a yeoman, which is also referred to as a Chief Petty Officer. His battle station was the Citer for one of the anti-aircraft guns. When the ship was under attack by enemy aircraft, he faced the ship's control tower, facing away from the ocean and attacking aircraft, to receive oral commands from the tower. He would then relay the commands to the gunner. This enabled the gunner to target the aircraft chosen for him by command without having to look or listen to the control tower. In July 1945, the Navy sent Tom to Galveston, Texas which is where he was honorably discharged in February 1946. At this point, our story goes back in time to Norma's birth. Clawson, Michigan, a small town north of Detroit, on May 1, 1926, Norma Lee Anderson was born to Joseph Slay Anderson and his wife, the former Laura Erpel Weaver. The Andersons were from Arkansas. They had moved to Michigan just before Norma was born. Slay was working in a Ford sales and service shop. Norma's mother, known as Erpel, her middle name, struggled with mental illness. Erpel was an intelligent woman, but she was plagued by paranoia and schizophrenia. Erpel became convinced from some source that the only nutrition her new daughter could have was mother's milk. This created a nearly tragic situation because Erpel's milk did not have enough nutrients to sustain her child. Norma became extremely thin. 
and might have died except for a trip home to visit grandparents in Arkansas. On this trip, one of Norma's grandmothers, after observing how thin the child was, gave her some chicken bones to chew and some gravy. Norma sucked on the bones and was able to swallow the gravy. Then she went to sleep. She had not been sleeping well for a long time because she was always hungry. According to Slay, Erpel became hysterical, saying things like, You have killed my baby. The grandmother told her that her child was starving. She was sleeping because it was the first time she had had her stomach filled. When Norma woke up and obviously was feeling much better than before she ate, Erpel began to change her mind and started feeding Norma in addition to the nursing. Norma was a precocious child. She walked at eight months. She began talking before her first birthday, and she was an outstanding student. Her father, Slay, moved the family back to Arkansas after a short stay in Michigan. Slay and Erpel had two other children, both boys. Neither of them lived more than a week past birth. One boy was born before Norma and the other after Norma. It is believed that the boys were born in Arkansas, but neither of their graves has been located. Slay wanted to farm. He went into the dairy business in Corning, Arkansas by renting a dairy farm from an individual. The rental agreement included the house which was on the property. Norma learned to drive at about 12 years old and she helped with delivering milk. Most of us would not allow one of our children to drive at 12 years old, but Norma did it as a job for her father. Slay told his grandsons that Norma was a bit of a tomboy, ironic considering her future husband's name. She liked to ride horses and was just very active. Slay would never let her have a bicycle because he was afraid that she would get hurt or killed. As an adult, she learned how to ride a bicycle, but was very unsteady. One Sunday morning in late 1939 or early 1940, while Slay, Erpel, and Norma were at church, the owner of the farm burned the dairy barn and the residence to the ground to collect insurance. At this point, Slay decided to take up carpentry construction. His father had been a carpenter. When World War II started, Slay began following military construction in Texas. There were numerous military airfields under construction there. At first, Norma and Erpel stayed in Arkansas. Later, they joined Slay in Texas. In 1943, Norma graduated from high school in Tyler, Texas. She had the highest grade point average in the school but the administration refused to let her be the valedictorian because she had attended Tyler High School for only one year. They may have allowed her to be salutatorian, but the family doesn't know. After graduation, Nora was accepted into Abilene Christian College. She was an excellent student, but she did not have funding to continue after her first year. So Norma returned home to live with her parents and earn money to continue her college studies. This is where our two stories merge. Slay and Erpel were living in Galveston in 1945. Tom and Norma met at the Broadway Church of Christ in Galveston in 1945. Tom was very interested in Norma, and Norma was interested in Tom. They had a short courtship of about five months. Sometime in the second half of 1945, the Andersons moved to Houston. They joined the Central Church of Christ. On December 11th, 1945, Tom and Norma were married at the Central Church of Christ in Houston. Tom's two sisters, Doris and Ann, attended the wedding. His mother, Daisy, did not attend. But Tom loved his mother. 
For many years, he wrote to her every week. Daisy did attend Tom's funeral in 1977. After a honeymoon in New Orleans, the newlyweds moved to Knoxville, Tennessee, where Tom was going to complete a bachelor's degree. Norma also enrolled in the University of Tennessee. On the way to Knoxville, they stopped in Columbia so Norma could meet Tom's family. It was during this family visit that Norma made a painful discovery. After Tom and Norma met in Galveston and before they were married, Tom had made a trip home without Norma. On this trip, Tom had looked up an old girlfriend to see if she was still interested in him. She was not. So Tom went back to Texas to continue his pursuit of Norma. He had never mentioned this to Norma, but someone in his family told her. This hurt Norma deeply, but she never told any of her sons about it. They heard about this from someone else in the family. Clearly, Norma forgave Tom, and they went on with their life together. Tom finished his bachelor's degree at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, but Norma had to drop out because she was with child. After Tom's graduation, they moved back to Houston, where their first child, a 10-pound, 3-ounce boy, was born on November 29, 1947. They named him Thomas Joe. Tom and Norma could have stayed in Tennessee, but that was evidently not what Tom wanted. He liked Houston, and Norma's parents were there. He was the only one of his immediate family to leave Murray County, Tennessee. After returning to Houston, Tom got a job with the Louisville and Nashville Railroad. Tom and Norma bought a two-bedroom, one-bathroom house at 4331 Oxford Street. Less than two years after Tommy was born, they had their second son. On October 15, 1949, Timothy Ryan, a 10-pound, one-ounce boy, was born. Tom knew that he wanted to be a teacher like his father. To improve his chances of getting a teaching job, Tom enrolled in the University of Houston master's degree program for business education. He attended night classes for two years and completed the degree. Tom then got a job with the Houston Independent School District, HISD, teaching math at Burbank Junior High School. This was the beginning of a 23-year career with HISD. He taught at five schools, Burbank Junior High, Houston Vocational Technical High, also known as Votech, San Jacinto High, Waltrip High, and Austin High. When Tom started at Burbank, Houston schools were crowded because Houston was a boom town, growing very fast. Tom had to be a, a floater at Burbank, which meant he did not have his own room. He had to carry all of his materials to each class. This was difficult, but he stayed with it for two years. Then he got a position at Votech. This was much better. He had his own classroom, and he was teaching the subjects he liked. Shorthand, business math, accounting, business management, business law, and typing. A few years after Votech was merged with San Jacinto, Tom decided he wanted a job closer to home. So he applied for a transfer to Waltrip, the high school his sons attended. He got it. But then, four years later, HISD was under a desegregation order, which included desegregating faculty. The unfortunate part of this for Tom was that seniority was counted only by the years the teacher had been at his or her current school. He was transferred to Austin High, which was on the south side of town, a very long drive for Tom. He tried to appeal this decision, but to no avail. So he made the best of it. Many of Tom's students sent him letters expressing their appreciation for his instruction and help in preparing them for their jobs. About seven years and eight months after the birth of their second child, 
Tom and Norma had their f third child. On June 21st, 1957, a nine pound, eight ounce boy was born to them. They named him Jonathan David. Although the smallest at birth, David was the biggest boy and then man. It was not even close. When he reached his full stature, David was six feet six inches wide. No, 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 six feet six inches tall, not wide, tall. That, quote, mistake, unquote, is a small sample of the teasing and even torture that David had to endure from his older brothers. They loved him. Everybody loved David. But his older brothers were determined to have David grow up tough and resilient. They were successful. Norma's mother, Laura Erpel, was mentally ill. Norma and her father, Slay, managed to have Erpel analyzed by a psychiatrist. The diagnosis was paranoid schizophrenia. Norma and Slay were able to have Erpel committed to a mental hospital for treatment. Erpel had three brothers and a sister. When her older brother, Noble, heard about Erpel's commitment to a mental hospital, he traveled from St. Louis to Houston and checked Erpel out of the mental hospital. Noble took Erpel to St. Louis to live with him and his wife. About two, after about two weeks, Noble realized that he had been wrong. He knew that Erpel was, in fact, mentally ill. Noble's response to this realization was the exact opposite of his name. He put Erpel on a bus to Houston and informed his niece and brother-in-law that they would need to pick her up at the bus station. When Erpel arrived back in Houston, Norma and Slay did not have the will to go through the commitment process again. Erpel was free to do as she pleased. Slay had moved out of their house. Erpel began to get money and other assistance from churches by telling them she was destitute. She actually refused help from Slay and Norma and would not talk to them. This went on until Slay had to divorce Erpel to protect himself from liability for her fraudulent activities. This sequence of events was extremely painful for Norma and Slay. Norma never talked to her sons about this. The boys did see her by herself crying once in a while. They now know that this was almost certainly related to her mother's situation. There were other events and issues that Norma had to face with her parents. She was the only surviving child, so she had to provide help for them by herself. She proved to be strong and wise, a great blessing to her parents. There were situations with Erpel which had no appealing options. Slay once said that dealing with her mother had Norma between the devil and the deep blue sea. In 1960, the Ashtons moved to 3708 Sherwood Lane. It was a bigger house on a bigger lot in a better neighborhood. The boys could play baseball and football in the front yard. Originally, Sherwood Lane ended at a narrow shell road named Teleford. On the other side of Teleford were woods and a bio. It was a great place for children, especially boys. Tom was intent on supporting his family. He was also deeply committed to the church, Central Church of Christ, and he was appointed a deacon in that congregation. His teacher's salary was not enough to support his five-member family. So Tom took on driving a school bus. Then he added teaching night school. When even those extra jobs did not quite supply enough income, Tom took a job at Western Auto selling hardware on Saturdays. It is not surprising that Tom and Norma decided that Norma would have to get a job outside the home. Running the Ashton household was more than a full-time job, but with three extra jobs, Tom was hardly ever seen by his family. 
When David started kindergarten in September 1962, Norma enrolled in the University of Houston. Her goal was to get a bachelor's degree in secondary education and become a history teacher in Houston Public School. At first, she only took one or two courses per semester. When David started second grade in 1964, Norma started taking a full load of courses. Her sons were supposed to pitch in and help with the domestic chores during this time. Memory indicates that the boys may have done more chores than before Norma's full-time enrollment, but the two older ones could have done a lot more. A history major requires a great deal of reading, and of course, Norma wanted to finish as quickly as possible, so she took a heavy load and had to study at every opportunity. This included some 3 a.m. study periods when she would have no interruptions. She graduated with honors, receiving a bachelor's degree in secondary education in May 1966. She was able to transfer credit for courses taken at Abilene Christian in Tennessee, but all things considered, it was an amazing accomplishment. The oldest son, Tommy, also graduated in May 1966 from high school, one week after Norma's graduation. Norma got her history teacher job. She started at Marshall Junior High. Marshall was an inner city school in a very low income area. Tom and Norma had some serious discussions about whether it would be safe for her to take this job. There was a program to pay off her student loans if she taught there for a prescribed period of time. That incentive was stronger than their fears, so she took the job at Marshall. For several years, there was a strong principal, and she enjoyed teaching there, even though her car was stolen twice. When a new weak principal came in, she decided to transfer to Waltrip High School, where her three sons graduated. She taught history and economics at Waltrip. While she was teaching at Marshall, her second son, Tim, wanted to get advanced placement in American history via the College Entrance Examination Board testing program. Norma had a small book titled Pocket Book of American History. She loaned this to Tim along with copies of her junior high American history tests. Tim studied this material as a refresher and received six hours of college credit from the CWEB. Tom and Norma decided to sell their house on Sherwood Lane. Only David was still living at home. They got a good price for the Sherwood Lane property. They bought a nice house in a nice neighborhood where David could finish high school at Waltrip. There was ample room in this two-story house for family visits. And yet, the second son, Tim, took a while to accept the new home of his parents. He resented the sale of his second childhood home. In time, he came to like the new house. There were several Thanksgivings and Christmases celebrated at 1047 Lehman. In May of 1976, America's bicentennial year, Tom and Norma went to Washington, D.C. to see the sights. It was a great trip, according to both of them. The only negative part to the trip was that Tom's ankle swelled and caused him some pain. He had never had this before. Our story now moves to November of that same year. 1976. Tom's abdomen swelled up. He was not in pain, but the swelling was significant, and he knew it should be investigated. The doctors determined fairly quickly that his liver was enlarged. When the family heard this, they were afraid he might have cirrhosis or liver cancer. A liver biopsy was performed. Everyone was very anxious, waiting for the biopsy result. The first thing the doctor told his family was that Tom did not have cirrhosis or liver cancer. When the family heard that, they were so relieved that they did not really focus on the rest of what the doctor said. They thought that if he didn't have cancer, he would be okay. 
The problem Tom had was actually worse than cancer. The doctor told them that Tom had primary amyloidosis, and he added that this disease is normally discovered in an autopsy. At that time, there was no treatment for primary amyloidosis, and it advanced rapidly. The doctor was trying to tell them this without saying, your loved one is going to die fairly quickly, and there is nothing we can do to help him. Tom was diagnosed in November 1976. He died on January 7, 1977. He was 61. There was a funeral service at Central Church of Christ. His body was then flown to Tennessee and buried near his father's grave at the cemetery adjacent to the old Ashton place where Tom was born. When Tom died, Norma was 50 years old. She continued teaching for 13 and a half years and then retired at the age of 64. She still had energy and strength and she wanted to see some things. Norma made a trip to the Soviet Union before she retired. Over the next several years, Norma continued traveling. She went to Central and South America, Ireland, Israel, and probably some places her son didn't, sons didn't know about. It is known that she enjoyed herself. Norma lived alone in the house on Lehman from 1977 until 2010, or about 33 years. Somewhere between 2005 and 2007, Norma began to suffer from Alzheimer's disease. She had an amazingly strong mind. <clears throat> Most people would not have noticed anything wrong. After all, she was about 80 years old. No surprise if she had some memory lapses. But it became clear that it was more than that. In 2010, the boys moved Norma from her Lehman house to assisted living. Tommy had tried other options. She resolutely refused to live with Tommy and Nidra, even though both of them encouraged her to move in with them. So, Tommy and Nidra hired in-home caregivers to be with Norma. That didn't work because Norma ran them off. She thought they were invading her home. At this point, the only option was assisted living. This was accomplished without Norma's consent. Her three sons all felt a little guilty about that, but she had left them with no other option. Norma lived in the assisted living facility for about one and a half years. In October 2011, Norma had a hemorrhagic stroke. This led to her death on October 26, 2011. There was a funeral at Southwest Central Church of Christ. Norma was buried beside Tom in Tennessee. Norma was an amazing person. In spite of the Alzheimer's, which was confirmed by an autopsy, she was able to communicate and exhibit some understanding of what was happening around her. Very near the end of her life, Norma's daughter-in-law, Nidra, was giving her a foot massage. Someone asked Norma if she was enjoying the massage. She said, yes. Then someone asked, what is it worth to you? Norma answered, double time. Norma Lee Anderson Ashton and Thomas Jefferson Ashton lived exemplary lives. Neither of them was perfect, but they both had an abiding faith in Jesus Christ. They taught their sons well, both in words and by example. We, their sons, are very thankful that they were our parents. We offer this account of their lives and life together as a tribute to them. Mother and Dad, we look forward to seeing you in the kingdom of heaven. The End